So today we will uh, talk a little bit about these other parts of sex cord stromal tumors that we did not cover last time. And if we have some extra time at the end, I will also talk about the uh, adnexal Wolfian tumor. Sorry, so maybe some of us uh, is affected, infected with the uh, COVID nineteen, so they cannot uh, take part in this lecture, in this lecture today. So we can start now. Okay. Yeah. Yes, so, and if uh, if they want to watch it later, I will send you the link so yeah. they can uh, review our discussion. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So last time we talked about granulosa cell tumors and the uh, fibrothecoma tumors and some of the variants on uh, uh, that, such as the uh, um, microcystic stromal tumor and so forth. Tonight, today we will talk about the Sertoli uh, tumors, uh, Sertoli cell tumor, Sertoli lytic tumor, sex cord tumor with annular tubules. And uh, to some degree, we'll touch on the gynandroblastoma and steroid cell tumors as well. There also are some tumors that do not fit into one of these categories. And in that circumstance, we call them uh, sex cord stromal tumor unclassified. Um, so there still is a group of non-specified tumors uh, in this uh, uh, category. Um, one of the things that we try to remember about uh, these things is that they're very often age group and clinical presentation uh, quite specific. So for example, Sertoli cell tumors and Sertoli Leydig cell tumors tend to be uh, somewhat uh, younger patients, early adulthood. Uh, the Sertoli cell tumor is often uh, not functional, but occasionally there will be hormone impacts. Um, and this is usually a very benign tumor. Um, but if you see a lot of necrosis or atypia, you may be tempted to think that it's carcinoma um, and if you rule that out carcinoma on the basis of immunohistochemistry, uh, you could then think about a malignant Sertoli cell tumor uh, with the appropriate uh, markers and so forth. It usually has a, a tubular uh, pattern, as you would expect with Sertoli cells. So here's a, I don't have a, a case example to show you other than this picture which you see a nice tubular pattern, uh, fairly large tubules, long, elongated, a little bit of architectural complexity, and some hyaline stroma in between. So I have, I don't encounter this very often, I don't imagine you will, but to just be aware of that possibility. Sertoli Leydig tumors, however, are more frequent, they're still uncommon uh, in most practices, but can occasionally be encountered 
um, incidentally, in other words, unexpected finding uh, with removal of uh, a, an, an ovary for other purposes. Um, these more frequently have hormonal manifestations and that may lead to their discovery at an early age. And often it's sort of uh, androgenic, testosterone related. So there may be um, dysmenorrhea or there may be uh, sexual precocity or other kinds of uh, hirsutism and those kinds of changes. Um, there are a few situations where there are other associated tumors such as embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. And these tumors may also occasionally have uh, heterologous elements. Now, uh, the familial cases very frequently are related to uh, situations where there is a specific mutation, such as a DICER1 mutation that is familial. But even in the sporadic cases, uh, the DICER1 mutation can be identified uh, within the tumor uh, in many cases. It's not required, but in situations where you're uncertain, if you have the capability to do that testing, uh, that would be helpful uh, in uh, confirming the diagnosis. Grossly, as you can see here, um, these tend to be somewhat lobulated, a little bit yellowish <clears throat> uh, due to the, the, the hormonal components um, and have a little bit of uh, intervening fibrous stroma. It's in these stromal elements and often at the periphery that you're going to be most likely to find the lytic elements. And so you have to be sure that you sample uh, the, the tumor quite well because those elements may be fairly uh, localized. So here's a, uh, uh, a digital slide example. And uh, I think I've sent you the link to this presentation so that if you want to review the uh, digital slides uh, on your own, you can do that. Um, but here you see that the majority of this tumor, and this is a frozen section, so that's why the morphology is a little bit skewed. Um, you see there's a slightly trabecular pattern. The cells are fairly uh, bland, low-grade appearing uh, kind of thing. Um, and we don't necessarily see right off the bat uh, lighting cells uh, in this lesion. We might look around and occasionally find things that we think might be like, uh, you know, maybe a cell like this uh, might be a possible Leydig cell. But you, more often than not, you're not going to see and, and definitely be sure that you have Leydig cells on a frozen section because the morphology is not optimal. So I think in a case like this, uh, saying that you have a cellular tumor, uh, and mostly you want to put it into a category. Um, is this most likely a stromal, sex cord stromal tumor? Um, I think you could probably get to that uh, diagnosis uh, with this material on frozen section. And that should be enough information to help the surgeon know what to do next. You can see that it's not a high grade carcinoma uh, but it's a cellular tumor and therefore could be granulosa cell, could be Sertoli Leydig cell. That correct category enables them to do the next appropriate staining. Now, Sertoli Leydig cell tumors uh, come in a variety of uh, degrees of differentiation. Here's another case, a permanent section. Um, and the uh, the better differentiated tumors will have nicely defined tubular structures and readily identified um, Leydig cells. But the more uh, poorly differentiated ones uh, may be very spindled. So we'll just look at this one a little bit. 
And you can see there's a degree of uh, variability and, and sort of two cell populations here. So you've got more eosinophilic cells, and then you've got these darker, more amphiphilic cells that are slightly tubular, not really well-developed. Um, these eosinophilic cells have very round nuclei and fairly abundant cytoplasm. So these uh, cells <clears throat> are the Leydig cells in this case, and the Sertoli cells would be here. Now, there are some immunohistochemistries chemistries that can be useful uh, in differentiating these uh, two components. Sometimes MART1 will stain the Leydig cells, but not the Sertoli cells. Uh, and so we occasionally use that to uh, further refine our diagnosis. Uh, if you've got a fairly readily identifiable Leydig cell component, you can probably call it a well-differentiated tumor. Notice also here that there are large follicular spaces. So some tumors will have these large follicle-like structures uh, that, uh, that go along with the tumor as well, uh, even though that gross photograph was uh, entirely solid. Another example, uh, here we see not so many uh, follicular structures and a more diffuse pattern. We'll go to a little higher power. And I think you can begin to see here that there are these uh, slit-like spaces. Now that's quite different from what we just saw. If uh, you use your imagination, you may think that uh, this looks a little bit like the reedy ovary or the reedy testis. And that's an important thought to keep in your mind because there is a retiform Sertoli Leydig cell tumor that tends to have a more aggressive behavior. These lining cells would stain like uh, Sertoli cells, but you may have some difficulty in localizing the Leydig cells in a case like this. So you may have to hunt quite a bit to find them, but you'll see you also have these other tubular structures that look more like conventional Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. So here you see a, a quite nice Sertoli pattern for these tubules and cords of cells, but very few Leydig cells. So a situation like this, if I think this is a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, and I see these areas of uh, redeform pattern, if I don't find the uh, Leydig cells, I might do some stains. Uh, to help to see if I can identify them. But I think even if I didn't, I would probably still say favor Sertoli, Redeform Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. The differential for a case like this might be a, uh, a female adnexal tumor of Wolfian origin, uh, or possibly, you know, a uh, low grade serous carcinoma. Um, but the age group in a younger woman uh, and this pattern would be fairly helpful in defining the redeform Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Let's look at another example. And I'm showing you several cases so that you can come back and look at these digital slides uh, for yourself, because this is a very broad spectrum of uh, tumor types and morphologies. And so it's important to have seen a number of them. So here you see this more open uh, tubular pattern with a little bit of intervening tissue. It's mostly Sertoli cells. And so you might think of the Sertoli cell tumor that we just talked about um, if you don't find the Leydig cells. And um, I don't think I marked them on this slide. 
but it sometimes takes quite a bit of hunting around several slides to find the Leydig cells. And, and you'll notice here I'm searching at this interface because the oftentimes the interface between the tubular component and the stroma forms uh, the uh, key area to, to identify the tumor or to identify the Leydig cells. So looking along this peripheral margin uh, would be quite important to see if you could identify uh, the Leydig cells. So I'm going to leave this one and go to one more digital slide example. Um, and I, I believe this one actually may be from the testis. Um, Thought I had a case with heterologous elements, but I don't think I do. So here, I think you can see a few of these more eosinophilic cells scattered in here uh, that may be Leydig cells uh, in this uh, particular tumor. So because the Leydig cells don't always stand out, uh, this is often a tumor that is difficult to classify or may be missed um, the first time you look at it. Uh, but if you've seen a variety of these and get the idea for how these uh, tubules of Sertoli tumors uh, appear, then you'll be able to know, oh, I should search really hard and perhaps stain to identify the Leydig cell component. Now, if you find crystalloids of Rinke, that's very helpful and certainly diagnostic, but it's not required uh, for the diagnosis uh, of a, a cell type as being a, a Sertoli lytic tumor. Now, a couple of fixed photographs. Here's again this uh, reedy form pattern, and you see the very slit like angulated slight branching of these spaces just to, again, cement that pattern for you. And again, another with a very micro papillary type of pattern as well. So I give you this example for the rediform uh, type of uh, lesions. Now let's talk a little bit more about the uh, inhibin, or excuse me, about the uh, immunohistochemistry. So our usual markers for stromal tumors, uh, like inhibin, uh, MART1 will be positive, as I said, in the, in the Leydig cell component, SF1 and CD56, and very often calretinin and FOXL2. The Sertoli component can stain with WT1 uh, as well, and that can be very useful uh, as well for you. So what are we thinking about in terms of differential diagnosis? Well, if it's a very glandular type of thing, the tall columnar cells, tubular structures, endometrial carcinomas can look like that. Uh, adult granulosa cell tumor can have a, a sort of more spindled or stromal pattern and resemble what Sertoli Leydig looks like. Krukenberg tumor can have small tubules that look a little bit like Sertoli Leydig tumor. Uh, carcinoids or struma with a tubular pattern might, although usually I think you'd recognize the uh, thyroid type uh, uh, um, colloid. For the poorly differentiated Sertoli Leydig cell tumors, sarcomas or undifferentiated malignancy can look like that in some circumstances. And if you have an abundance of heterologous elements, you might even think about teratoma, especially if you have a, an abundance of the heterologous elements and only a minor component of the Sertoli Leydig tumor. Um, so as I say at the bottom, you see why it's so fun to study these cases, because this is such a broad array 
germ cell tumors, teratomas, yolk sac, carcinomas of different types, other stromal tumors, metastases. Uh, it's just quite a diverse uh, picture of uh, tumors. Now, in terms of behavior, um, I've introduced you to some of these concepts. The well-differentiated tumors generally do well. The reediformed tumors typically do poorly. The poorly differentiated tumors may also do poorly. So there, those three factors are generally what we use to guide behavior. Uh, if they've ruptured, they can spread. And if they are already spread intra-abdominally, uh, that usually portends a bad outcome. In contrast to granulosa cell tumor, this tumor recurs early um, and usually in a less differentiated form than the uh, uh, primary. And thus, when it recurs, it may begin to look a little bit more sarcomatoid. Now, there are other tumors that can also recur as a sarcomatous lesion. Sometimes uh, serous carcinomas can recur as a dedifferentiated kind of uh, sarcomatoid carcinoma. So this is not the only uh, category to think about, but uh, that uh, is certainly true for these cases. Okay, any questions about Sertoli lytic tumors before we go on to the next uh, category? Uh, Professor uh, Hesso, uh, could you please explain why the yellowish color is uh, uh, manifest for the hormonal components? Because this is the first time I, I, I I heard about that. <laughs> well, I think yellow usually refers to lipid, oh, uh, okay. or I think of yellow as having an association with lipids. And so uh, steroid cell tumors, uh, adrenal gland areas, these tumors that are fairly lipid rich may have a, uh, uh, a yellowish color. And Sertoli Leydig tumors um, may have that that appearance as well. So, but but not always. It's it's it just was a a, a possible thought to think about uh, lipid containing tumors. Okay, so uh, uh, not only the hormonal, uh, you know, the the X of I I, I can imagine uh, uh, to the uh, the the X and the they have the um, they have the yellow color too. Yes. But other, yes. <laughs> yes, but other uh, tumors like the uh, you know the uh, uh, um, um, the sarcoma. They, yeah. Uh, <laughs> lipoma. They could yeah. have this. <laughs> it could have the yellow color. Thank you. So yes, if you think about in the ovary uh, corpus luteum, they're often yellow, you know, yellowish orange. Um, yes. That's related to the lipid content of those uh, <clears throat> cells and other other chromogens as well. Uh, but any steroid producing uh, hormonal component will usually be a more yellowish uh, kind of tumor. Yes, thank you, Professor. All right, a sex cord tumor with annular tubules, or what we call SCATAT. <laughs> um, this is a nice acronym, and uh, this, these are not common cases. Uh, they're often found incidentally um, in patients with putz jaegers syndrome, which I imagine is not common in Vietnam. Um, but they may occasionally present otherwise as a um, non-syndromic uh, occurrence. Um, and in those cases, it's usually uh, unilateral, whereas uh, in putz jaeger syndrome, it may actually be bilateral uh, fairly frequently. This is a tumor with a very characteristic morphology. And so once you have seen uh, this tumor, uh, you will remember it. Uh, 
uh, for a long time. Now, in this uh, digital slide section, you can see there's a lot of uh, sort of normal cortex and maybe a follicle here. Uh, and it's just a small portion of the tumor here uh, or of the ovary that has the tumor. Um, so it is, as you would say, an incidental finding in this situation. Actually, I think what we have here, this is actually not the tumor. This is, this is a uh, lipid granuloma. So uh, there's a sort of a fatty tissue here with a foreign body reaction. For some reason, there was some lipid uh, in that uh, case and it may, may have been related to the tumor, I don't know. Uh, so we'll just go to the, the tumor area. Oops, let's find it. Okay, here we are. And this sectioned poorly, I think, because there may have been some calcification in this uh, tumor. But here you see these uh, very characteristic nests of cells, you know, rounded nests pale cells, and then these very characteristic eosinophilic uh, tubules, the annular tubules uh, with homogeneous uh, eosinophilic material, and sometimes a little bit of peripheral palisading, nuclear palisading around them. So it's a very characteristic per, uh, appearance. It looks a little bit like uh, you know, call Exner bodies. But the distinction here is the polarity to the uh, nuclei. You'll notice that the nuclei are peripheral and they're around these annular tubules. In a um, call Exner body, uh, the nuclei don't have this uh, polarity and separation with the clearing of the cytoplasm. So uh, similar in some ways, but uh, quite easily distinguished on the basis of the uh, polarization of the nuclei and the uh, clear cytoplasm. So uh, I don't know the immunohistochemistry of this lesion because we, we don't usually need to do immunohistochemistry. Um, I suspect these may have some similarities to um, Sertoli cells and they probably stain with um, inhibin and other uh, markers of sex cord stromal tumors um, because we, of course, are classifying them in that category. Um, you know, it's conceivable that you could uh, miss a small one of these. You know, if you just had a, an area of this sort of thing in the cortex, you might not think of a sex cord tumor, tumor with annular tubules. Uh, because you don't have the annular tubules here. Um, but uh, if you have a little bit more, uh, you would then be able to make the diagnosis. In terms of uh, uh, other things to think about in this situation, um, differential diagnosis could include a gonadoblastoma. Uh, I mentioned granulosa cell tumor and Sertoli cell tumors as well. Some mixed germ cell tumors might have uh, mixed germ cell and sex cord stromal tumor elements, um, the so-called gynandroblastoma. If this is a not a Puch-Jaeger syndrome, uh, about one in five will actually be malignant and spread. But if it's a Puch-Jaeger syndrome patient, they're usually almost always benign. I've never seen a malignant one of these, so I don't know. Um, if they have a morphologic uh, difference specifically. All right, well, let's go on and talk about the uh, steroid cell tumors um, and uh, some of the things that are related to that, uh, since we've already mentioned the uh, uh, yellowish appearance. So the, the nondescript steroid cell tumor is the most common tumor. These can be younger patients, but have a wide age range. And usually they will have a functionality. So there's either cortisol, 
uh, aldosterone or other endocrine events that are record, reported. Um, and these, again, are positive for uh, sex cord stromal markers like inhibin and calretinin. But they also have uh, a few other specific markers like CD99 and 1433 sigma, uh, which I believe is a, a, um, another hormonal marker. And they'll usually be negative for cytokeratin, uh, S100, CEA, um, WT1, and, and so forth. So that could be useful if you were concerned about a possible carcinoma. So here we are, another nice yellowish, uh, bright yellow uh, tumor. Um, and I think the brighter the yellow, maybe the more likely it is that it's a hormone uh, producing uh, tumor. Uh, but this, you know, this looks very much like uh, the color you get with the corpus luteum or the color of your adrenal cortex uh, in so, uh, many instances. And that uh, is related to what's going on in the cells. Now I have one digital slide example uh, to share with you as well on this case. Um, and you see these tend to be sharply circumscribed um, and quite densely cellular. And here you can see how they're sort of in these cords um, and nested pattern, a bit of pale cytoplasm. Um, they look very much like a, a steroid type uh, hormone producing cell um, with this nesting and so forth. So a high power view of an area like this, and I said, this is from the adrenal cortex, you would probably believe me because this is sort of how they look. Um, but in the ovary uh, with this appearance, we should think steroid cell tumor. Now, there are steroid cell rests that occur normally in the hilum of the ovary. And that's also where these tumors uh, usually occur. So what is the boundary between a steroid cell rest and a steroid cell tumor? Well, unfortunately, I'm not aware that there's a sharp distinction. But I think usually once you be, uh, grow larger than a millimeter or two, I would prefer that you call it a tumor rather than a rest. In either case, the behavior is usually going to be very favorable, um, but uh, you do want to be aware of the possibility that uh, the larger ones and advanced age and Cushing's disease, those may be factors that suggest uh, malignancy. Uh, also, uh, larger size or mitotic activity, other features of malignancy uh, should be uh, uh, considered in terms of these issues as well. Um, pure lighting cell tumors also exist. Uh, these are relatively uncommon as well. Um, and again, crystalloids are rank ranky or not uh, required, but are very useful. These also uh, occur in the ovarian hilus, similar to where the steroid cell tumors uh, occur. Um, and these tend to produce testosterone and therefore virilization or hirsutism and so forth. Um, now, if you don't see crystalloids, what do you need to have? Well, um, hilus cell hyperplasia, non-medulated nerve fibers, fibrinoid vascular change or nuclear clustering. Um, you know, these are all features that are more suggestive of a lighting cell tumor uh, as opposed to steroid cell rest or um, uh, steroid cell tumor. I think I have a gross picture of a lighting cell tumor. Uh, here you see the ovarian hilus, a little pigmented uh, lesion. Um, and here's your uh, image, not, not a really great image, but you can see it's not making tubules. It's, it's not particularly nested. Here's that fibrinoid vascular change we commented on. Um, and if you were able to go to high magnification, uh, you would be able to see um, uh, crystalloids in this case. Now I have included some digital slides from a uh, gynandroblastoma. 
um, which is a, a, a very uncommon tumor uh, that has some sort of combinations of uh, Sertoli Leydig cell tumor and uh, a granulosa cell tumor. Um, and they're not always well-defined uh, differences, but if you see features that begin to look like, you know, here you see these little tubular patterns, nested patterns that could be seen in a granulosa cell tumor, um, or could be seen in Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Um, and if we were to find um, Leydig cells here, that would, you know, we might be saying, okay, this looks like a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Um, I don't remember if we've got defined areas here. I think over here, there were some lighting like cells. So sometimes these uh, foamy cells uh, can also be a lighting uh, type cell uh, manifestation um, or suggest that possibility. So you see these foam cells here that could be related to um, uh, lighting cells. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because it's a very uncommon tumor but I've uh, included these slides here so that if you want to come back and just uh, look at it on your own time, you can uh, study through this and see uh, for yourself if you can differentiate, you know, maybe some areas like here, you know, that's probably a Leydig cell tumor, that's probably a Leydig cell, that's probably a Leydig cell. Some of these are probably Leydig cells, whereas over here we're more Sertoli-like. Um, and then there were some other areas that looked more like uh, granulosa cell tumor um, in this uh, case as well. Um, and here's another of those slides. So those are some of the, some of the, the cases that I had from the Sertoli Leydig cell and the sex cord stromal tumors. Um, I'd like to spend the next uh, several minutes and uh, go over um, the uh, um, Wolfian tumor, which is uh, also quite uncommon, but you know, in the last few years, we've seen a couple of these uh, cases. And so uh, this was a 40, assuming an older patient who had an adnexal mass. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a cellular tumor. Uh, this is the digital slide. And in this particular case, you can see there's kind of a, an a organoid pattern, but there's some sort of spindle-shaped cells to this tumor um, and some intervening uh, vascular septi and so forth. So you might think that this is a sex cord stromal tumor because of this sort of mixture of a spindle cell pattern and it doesn't look epithelial per se, uh, to any great degree. Although maybe it has a little bit of a tubular type function. So you can see how this might look a little bit like a Sertoli Leydig tumor uh, or a sex cord stromal tumor unclassified. Now, if many of these are outside of the ovary in the hilum, not uh, directly involving the ovary. And so that's sometimes a helpful feature. Um, but uh, not always. Sometimes they can abut or invade uh, the uh, ovary as well. So that's one morphology that we can see with this. Um, this is uh, usually adult patients. Um, and as I mentioned, usually in the broad ligament or fallopian tube area, uh, it can be solid or solid cystic. Um, and about 10% of these uh, behave uh, in a malignant fashion. Uh, so that's something to be concerned about, but we don't really always have reliable predictors of which ones will be malignant and which ones will not be. Now, in contrast to Sertoli Leydig cell tumors, these tend to be a little bit grayer, a little bit more tan, uh, but that's a very soft uh, distinction between the two lesions. Immunohistochemistry can be fairly useful. 
um, but because the differential is quite broad. We've mentioned uh, sex cord stromal tumors. If it's a very glandular differentiation thing, it can look like endometrioid carcinoma. Sometimes neuroendocrine tumors can have spindle cell and epithelioid components, or we might think about metastasis. And if it becomes very spindled, then you might think about sarcomas like uh, stromal sarcoma, solitary fibrous tumor, or even GI stromal tumor, which may occasionally occur in the, in the GYN tract. This is a distinctive tumor in the sense that it is often positive with both cytokeratin and vimentin. It may express hormones, androgen receptor as well, but it's negative with the usual um, uh, sex cord stromal markers. So that's helpful to rule out that piece of things. And then variable staining with uh, these other markers. So here's another case that I had recently. Um, and in this case, you can see there's sort of a mixture of solid and some sort of follicular or, or, or cystic components. Um, and we had this case on frozen section. And because it had this very nice glandular component here, you see you know, nice epithelioid glandular appearances like this. I wondered uh, at the time of frozen section if this might be an endometrioid uh, carcinoma. Uh, but I also noted that it tended to have this other intervening solid or stromal-like elements that merged to a degree with this uh, tumor. Um, so I, you know, I didn't come out and say endometrioid carcinoma. I said, you know, this is a, an epithelioid neoplasm could be endometrioid carcinoma, um, but I'm not totally sure. Um, and uh, so they proceeded to resect and did some staging biopsies as well. I'll show you another section of this tumor. Here you see much more of this uh, follicular pattern, uh, you know, macro cystic spaces. Um, so this looks a lot, uh, you know, you wonder maybe it's even a mucinous tumor or something like that. But in addition here to these, you know, nicely defined columnar cell line glands, we have this stromal element that just didn't seem to fit uh, with that. So uh, we went to town on our immunohistochemistries with this, and I'll show you kind of how we walk through these. So um, here is our um, bimentin stain. And as you can see, um, some elements of this are positive, the intervening stromal elements of the tumor. And even these columnar cells have some vimentin positivity. Now, of course, endometrioid tumors can have that type of uh, vimentin expression as well. So that didn't uh, totally exclude um, the uh, possibility of uh, endometrioid carcinoma. We'll look at this uh, marker here. I believe this is a pancytokeratin. And as you can see, there's kind of variable expression, nice membranous expression in the columnar cells, less strong or less intense uh, in some of the other areas, uh, but positive for cytokeratin. So it's cytokeratin and vimentin positive. And then we have sort of a, a a divergent pattern here. Let's just take a look here. I think this is a hormone receptor. As you can see, we've got very strong uh, control here. So this is, uh, I believe, estrogen or progesterone. And you can see we have some areas that are positive, some quite strongly positive, and others less so. So it's got some hormone receptors. Let's see, what's our, so this is CD10, uh, staining the follicles of the uh, germinal center. 
And we use it to define sort of endometrial type stroma and stromal sarcomas. And here notice that we do have some positivity in some of these cells. So um, is this still endometrioid stroma? I wondered about that as well. Um, this, I believe, let's see here. CK7. All right, so this is CK7, and the tumor is negative with CK7, which should help us to largely exclude endometrial carcinoma. So, because most endometrial carcinomas will be strongly CK7 positive, and we just have maybe a little bit of patchy uh, positivity here and there, uh, not necessarily in the, the bulk of the tumor. So that helps to exclude uh, endometrial carcinomas uh, from that standpoint. And what's this stain here? I believe this is uh, PAX-8 and the tumor is negative for PAX-8. And then Estrogen receptor, you can see the positive staining in certain areas. And uh, this is uh, P53, it's P53 negative. Or this, you know, let's see, maybe, maybe this may be, this may be a squamous marker, P53, nope, I was right. So P53 is negative. Uh, let's just make sure it's the wild type of uh, negative. This can be somewhat subtle, but we can see that there are a few positive cells, some weakly positive. So this uh, does fit into the wild type of uh, P53 uh, pattern. One more stain here. This is GATA3, um, ruling out breast cancer. You can see that that's negative. And what's this marker here? Let's see what we're getting here. So this is WT1, which if we're thinking about uh, you know, lighting cell tumors should be positive in some of those, but clearly negative. And if it's a serous or other type of lesion, that uh, excludes that. So uh, you can see sort of how we walked through this and concluded um, where we ended up here. This is calretinin. So calretinin excluded the other sex cord stromal tumor. So just to give you a walkthrough on those uh, issues uh, in terms of immunohistochemistry uh, in this example, uh, sometimes it does take a lot of immunohistochemistries to get to the right answer. So that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to share with you today. Um, and so this was a female adnexal tumor of probable Wolfian origin, or the uh, uh, acronym for that is FATWO, F-A-T-W-O, uh, uh, just like the SCATAT. Uh, at one point, the, those type of acronyms were very uh, common for uh, our colleagues in GYN pathology. So any questions uh, as we wrap up here? So, Prof, so, so, so um, how do we uh, manage with the the tumor, the, the tumor in the last case, because uh, it uh, doesn't look like uh, the uh, 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 endometrial carcinoma or uh, doesn't look like uh, the uh, the sexually related cell tumor. So how do you manage <laughs> with this? So on the frozen section, as I indicated, we said that it would look like 
um, a cellular uh, tumor, yep. I thought possibly endometrioid carcinoma or other uh, malignant epithelioid neoplasm. So with that information, the surgeon did um, a full intra-abdominal staging evaluation to uh, make sure that this was a stage one tumor. And then there's not a lot of information about what therapies, uh, chemotherapy or otherwise is needed or helpful in these cases. Yes. This was a stage 1A tumor. And yes. so I believe in her situation that observation was uh, chosen, um, but they might in some circumstances choose to try a, a fairly mild uh, regimen of, you know, uh, paclitaxel or something of that sort um, to provide some um, additional uh, uh, reassurance. But I think more likely they would wait until there was a recurrence before they would begin to try to treat with chemotherapy uh, in this case. Um, some of them, as I've said, can be malignant, but we don't have enough data to predict really well which ones will and which ones will not. Yes, because uh, uh, I, I think that uh, your diagnosis is uh, uncommon in our culture, because in my hospital, uh, the, the doctors often ask us to give them the precise name. <laughs> so that I, I think it's the difficult with us. <laughs> Yes, and as you see, there are a number of immunohistochemistries to uh, sort out the differential diagnosis. Yes. And I always have to go to the book and look up which ones are which uh, in an uncommon case like this to make sure that I can be as confident as possible uh, that it's uh, um, this versus other, other sorts of things. Yes, thank you, Professor. Dr. Lin, Dr. Hung, anything that you want to ask? Yeah, thank you for uh, your, your lecture. And actually, I have no experience at all in uh, diagnosing this tumor. But uh, I have, I, I wonder uh, about the uh, circulating tumor. Uh, as you said, this tumor is related uh, with uh, testosterone level. So can we use this, uh, can we use testosterone test in uh, um, clinical practice to uh, help us in diagnosing this tumor? Uh, and uh, question two is that uh, I think uh, um, sometimes we, uh, we, uh, um, we, play, we feel so hard to find a uh, lining cell. So yes. can you share with us some tips to buy this, uh, this cell to make uh, a diagnosis of the tumor? And uh, the question three that I, uh, I ask you that um, I, I, I think I, I saw a big tumor is look like the casting reef tumor. It is the certainly medic tumor uh, has only solid uh, component. It, uh, Seem to uh, seem to look like uh, the casting tumor. So, uh, how how can you distinguish distinguish the uh, tumors? Uh, good question. So, first question: um, Testosterone can be a tumor marker for Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, but it is not very clinically sensitive to follow patients as a marker. So if a patient has a preoperative elevated testosterone, then you want to definitely think about Sertoli Leydig tumor or other you know, Leydig cell tumor kinds of tumors as possible differential diagnosis. Um, but after surgery, um, it would not be very effective as a, as a marker because the the magnitude of change is so small with an early recurrence. So it's not uh, highly sensitive for recurrence. Uh, your second question about carcinoid tumors, uh, solid type and, uh, 
uh, Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. Yes, I think there can be some overlap uh, morphologically. There are some similarities of trabeculae and so forth. But immunohistochemistry would be very helpful and very clear on that. Uh, synaptophysin should be positive in your um, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, your carcinoid tumors. Inhibin uh, will almost always be positive or other stromal markers, calretinin or MART1 uh, in the, uh, the other tumors. So that can be very helpful differentially. Well, it's been a delight to be with you. I need to, to sign off here. I will send Dr. Lin the, uh, the link for the video recording and the link to the digital slide presentations that we've used. So if you want to go and look at those afterwards, you can do that. And then we will meet again the last week of this month. So you'll get two weeks in March. We will, we will do this time. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye and see you again. Okay. Wonderful to be with you as always. Thank you.